I want to welcome Jakub. We Hello. debated his name right. already. I'm just going to hold this. This is impossible to oh, pin. Uh, I think you can just... Uh, Where? To my... Yeah, that also yeah, works. Okay. Hello? Yeah. Is it okay? Can you hear him well? Yeah. Good. Is it okay? Yeah. Okay. Great. So welcome, We're Jakub. Start, yeah? And yeah, nice to see and learn more about WASI. So, um, hey guys, um, I'm going to talk to you today briefly about WASI. Um, but before we get on, uh, let me, I guess, introduce myself. Um, this is actually my first time at FOSDEM and first time presenting. Uh, so far, it's great. Um, so, my name is Jacob Konka. I'm an R&D researcher at Golem Factory. Um, for all the links and stuff you want to see more, you can find this on the FOSDEM events um, webpage for the talk. I try to put every, everything there. If you have any more questions about stuff, just feel free to ask me probably after so that we can get through this. And then I want to show you some live coding as well. Hopefully we have time for that. So um, I'm a regular contributor to Wasm Time and Wasi. Um, and one of the authors of Wasi Common Library that's used in both Wasm Time and Lucid Wasi Runtimes. Um, and I'm going to get to that later on as well. I'm also a member of the WebAssembly community group. Um, and you can actually, if, if you have any questions, just feel free to reach me on any of the handles. Um, private emails are fine as well, I don't mind. Right, so what is WASI? Um, very briefly, WASI stands for WebAssembly System Interface. Um, it's a pretty new thing. Um, I think it officially was announced last year around March, April time. Um, Currently, it's being standardized by a community group called Bytecode Alliance. Now, By Bytecode Alliance was formed in November 2019 by four founding members, that be Mozilla, Fastly, Red Hat, and Intel. Um, all of those companies have actually something to do with WebAssembly and um, uh, computation outside of the browser using WASM. Um, so why WASI? Because we already have a scripting target. We have the unknown unknown target for WASM. So WASI is trying to take WASM outside of the browser, unlike in scripting, and actually do it uh, with security in mind first. So it's, the security is based on capability-based security model, kind of like Cloud Abbey, um, Capsicum, or whatnot. Um, so basically, it just, just, just will give you the safe and portable access to the host resources. Um, if you want to learn more, uh, you know, have a look at the official website, which is wasi.dev. Um, so how does it work? It's actually pretty simple. You take your C, C++, Rust, binary, or library, mainly. Um, you cross-compile that to WASM, using was to WASM32 WASI target. You get your WASM module with some exports defined and imports that the embedder or the runtime should provide. You put that in the box, which is the sandbox. Could be WASM time or Lucet. Now, the tricky, here, the tricky bit here is that um, if you don't give it any capabilities, you can't really do anything except for, for example, read from student or write to student or student. Um, if you want to do something fancy with your WASM app, you have to give it capabilities. So for instance, you could allow it access to the um, uh, workspace there under slash, right? You could give it access to the um, host entropy, but all of this requires a capability because by default, you don't get access to anything. Um, so for instance, in this case, we're going to give it access to workspace and entropy, but we're not going to give it access to slash dev or clocks or in general time. Um, this way, actually, you know, it's actually easier to give capabilities than take them away, because you can always forget about something and things just happen. Um, so to put it into, into more context, for instance, uh, oh, by the way, I'm using Rust, I hope. Um, you know, I, I'm not really a good C developer. I, I mainly use Rust, so sorry for this if you guys are not into Rust at all. Um, so we can actually create a file in workspace directory. We can access the entropy with run thread and RNG, but we cannot, for example, open dev null because we don't have access to that via the capability. So that's a no-go. And we also cannot call system time now because we're also lacking this. So this is cool. You can actually um, run apps that you don't really trust because you can enforce some degree of security using capabilities. Okay, so now what is the setting? Um, the setting is fairly specific. So I work for Golem Factory. Um, Golem Factory is trying to create a, it's a blockchain startup. It's trying to create like a decentralized market for computation where you can buy and, and, and actually sell computation power. 
you basically, if you have a problem, you call yourself a requester, you want to basically do like a map reduce kind of app. For the moment, you write your task, you then specify how it's meant to be divided into chunks, and then as a provider, so a person who's actually renting the computation power is gonna compute that for you, um, each part of the SAP task. Uh, the trick here is that obviously it's untrusted. It's not like Amazon AWS or Google Cloud. You, you don't really trust the node because you have no idea who they are. So things can go wrong, right? They might have an incentive to lie to you or whatever. Um, so that's why WASM and WASI come, uh, come in handy because they give us some degree of security in the sense that, you know, even if you're a malicious requester and you're gonna do, wanna do something crazy, um, you can actually, with WASI, you can restrict what they're gonna do. So um, in Golem, you can actually, one of the use cases, like you, can, you can write your own WASM maps and then send them to the Golem network. Now, how it works currently, um, we compile, you're allowed to compile your app to mscripten, or you have to if you wanna run it on Golem. Um, that is because when we started looking into this, WASI wasn't even announced yet. That was end of 2018, I think. So I think WASMR started doing some stuff in the sense that they were trying to um, take script and do something useful with it. And we basically, you know, we were caught in this, this wee bubble. So we use script to do our bidding. Um, our sandbox is SpiderMonkey based, so we took SpiderMonkey JS engine and embedded that. Um, and essentially speaking, you basically have to preload all the resources you want into memory and everything is in the host memory. So that's also not ideal, plus you have to deal with JavaScript. So that's why was, when, when WASI was announced, it was perfect because you, know, you don't have to deal with JS and you, don't, you, you have a better way of tracking what capabilities you give. Um, so the other thing that's actually quite tricky, and this is really tricky, is if you send it, if you, if you as a requester want to get something computed and the node is not trusted, how the heck do you tell whether what they return is valid or not? Right? It, there is no trust, so to speak. So one of the ways of handling this automatically so that the user doesn't have to worry about this stuff is duplicating the work. So we call this verification by redundancy and you can duplicate one task or subtasks, a subtask into two, send it to two different nodes and then compare the results. But in order to compare the results, you need determinism, because otherwise, you know, if you want to do it by, 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 which is the simplest way. If you don't have determinism, then, then good luck. It's actually, for every single use case or app, you would have to come up with your own way of verifying, which is just annoying. Um, so this is where determinism requirement comes from. Um, and I know it's also useful for um, mm, blockchain guys who actually do the lower level stuff, like smart contracts, obviously there you, ha you need determinism at all, on all levels. Um, Right, so is WASI deterministic? Um, unfortunately, it's not. Uh, there is actually many avenues which give you non-determinism, and so WASM itself has certain things that might make it non-deterministic, and with WASI, we add even more things. Uh, so one of the obvious ones is obviously access to random device. And this is done with the syscall random get, which under the hood should call something like get random to actually access the host entropy. Um, so the good news is that with the upcoming snapshot, which is in the works now in WASI, this will get, get it, its own module, like WASM module, and will require a capability to be enabled. So by default, it's gonna be disabled. So this is good. So one less thing to worry about. Um, the other one is system clocks. Same story as with random get. Currently, it's enabled by default, which is essentially a spec bug, but you know, we were just specking that out. Um, but in the future, it's gonna get its own module and will require capability, so that's another thing. Now, more subtle ones, and those are the interesting ones, are, for example, um, the contents of file stat. Uh, so this has almost direct mapping to what's happening on the host. And uh, file, stat, file stat returns things like the inode, the file type, and the worst thing is it's got um, access, modification, and control times. And this is tricky. It's not that easy. You know, you, you, you wouldn't want, if you want to keep it in WASI so that you can use it in your deterministic program, you have to do some crazy stuff here, like, I don't know, filtering out parts of the struct. 
Um, I don't think sticking anything emulated inside or like random numbers, or random numbers like zero or something is going to work. So this will require some more time. Um, the easiest thing would be to just disable it somehow. And we're going to get to that in a minute. Um, this one is one of my favorites. So something as useful as listing contents of a directory can give you a notion of non-determinism because guess what? Order of entries is dependent not only on the host, but also the file system used. Uh, so nobody, make, like, nobody makes any guarantees how you're going to get the results back. So this is also tricky, but it's also useful, right? Because it's better if I give you just, hey, this is the directory. Just list the entries yourself rather than me explicitly passing everything to you. That's not ideal. And actually, the list is quite long. I was surprised because I started with a couple and then um, people joined in and it turns out that there is a lot of things that can go wrong. So, and I encourage and invite you to actually join the discussion and have a look. Um, it's pretty good. So the link is there. It's under WebAssembly WASI issues 190. Um, right. So can we, can we actually make WASI deterministic as it is now? Um, so that was the question. Um, the answer is, is pretty much, it's, it's missing a couple of things, but we can still deal with that in a hacky way, but still. So the, the model that I want to present today is very straightforward. It's kind of like, um, you can think of it as delegated functions, I guess. It's basically um, you export a function, let's call it compute, that takes in two WASI file descriptors. Now I'm going to get into what the file descriptors and writes are in a minute. And basically what we require here is that the input file descriptor only allows you to read from it. So you can only read bytes and out, you can only write bytes to it. Okay, and that's it. And because of the capability-based model, we can actually enforce that um, with, with ease nowadays in, in, in WASI. Okay, so now what is the WASI file descriptor? It's, it's an index into a table where we store capabilities or actually entries to the host resources. Uh, so the simplest one is zero, which well, doesn't have to, but normally points to standard input, one to standard output, two to standard error, and then the rest is actually what you pre-open. Um, so in WASI, you call this pre-opening. So for instance, um, under WASI file descriptor 11, you're going to store an entry, which has quite a few fields, but the most important ones are the actual always handle, which is the um, host specific handle to the resource. On Linux, that would be um, a file descriptor. On Windows, that would be a Windows file handle, for instance. So it can be anything. It can be, even be a socket and whatnot. And you also have base rights and inheriting rights. Now, base rights describe what you can actually do with the set file descriptor, uh, whether you can read from it, you can write to it, if you can uh, ask for the file stat, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And inheriting rights are a bit more tricky. They are used, um, they will be the base rights of any file descriptor that's being derived from this one. So this is mainly useful in, um, if you do things like path open. So if you, um, given a file descriptor to a directory, you want to open a file under that directory, right? So this is gonna get the inheriting rights. Uh, so in our case, actually, it's, it's not really important, but it's, it's good to remember. Um, right, and then the WASI, uh, file descriptor writes. So as I said, and this is a powerful concept. So if, if the file descriptor has got FD read, you can only do two operations. I think actually three. You can also set writes. Anyway, uh, so you can do mainly FD read, right? But you cannot do, for example, FDP read, which is with the offset because you don't have seek or tell, which is pretty useful. And you can do FD, FD stat get, but this is, this, this is harmless because all it does, it returns the information about what writes it's got. What, what the file type is. So that's perfect, right? And you can actually do it nowadays. It's, it's now no magic. You can actually enforce that. And the same with write. You can invoke FD write to write bytes to a file descriptor. And I want to emphasize the fact that file descriptor can be anything. It's an abstract concept. So you can point to any resource on the host. And again, FD start get, right? But nothing else. And this is cool because this already weeds out all of the syscalls that use file descriptors and pass. However, as I said, um, so have we just achieved determinism? Well, almost, because there's still this. And nowadays, unfortunately, this is implicit, so you get access to all of those. Um, call it ambient, secu um, ambient authority or whatever, right? 
So you can actually call that. And there's no way of, um, in a nice, elegant way, of enforcing the um, at, at runtime not to do this. Uh, there are hacks to get, to, to get around this, and I'm going to show it in a minute. But um, the good news is that this will get sorted with the upcoming snapshot when it stabilizes. So um, do you guys have any questions until now? Yeah. Uh, Hi, Martin, by the way. Say again? If you just check in the binary, the header and the inputs, the same thing on. Okay, I'm not sure. Yeah? You say about checking those, if you are importing the symbols. Sure, sure, but okay, but there is no automatic mechanism of actually whitelisting. Oh, right. So um, I think what Martin is asking is, uh, why can't we not just check when importing the module if, it's, um, impo uh, importing the f if we're importing the function random get, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And this is my hack, but um, it's a hack, right? So no, no, that's a good question. Um, but the nice way, an elegant way, is actually if you can do that, you know, when you have the runtime spinning, you just say, like, then you will say import this or include this module. But nowadays, you can't do this. And that's the elegant way. But that's an excellent question, yes. So. Um, any more questions on this? Uh, or can we move on to the examples? Are we good on time, by the way? Yes, we're good. Cool. So um, when I was trying to figure this out, I prepared like a short, short set of examples, some of them very simple, one of them actually a bit more complicated to see, like a proof of concept to see whether this would actually work. And this is exactly what Martin was suggesting. I added that as well. So um, you can find them on my GitHub under KubeCon Wazi Compute. And there is the description, how to compile it using Rust, current Rust, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, there are three examples. The first one is uh, Hello Compute. It's that easy. You read from in input file descriptor, you uppercase, and then write out just to test that it actually works. The second one is to verify that, indeed, the two FDs have the right rights. And the third one, the, a, a little bit more tricky, is actually taking something, some existing library, in this case, uh, flight text-to-speech library or engine. Um, so what I did, I pre-compiled that from C to, um, to as the object, and I included them for convenience in the repo, and then you can actually statically link that into, your, uh, into this example, and it's going to create like a compute function that does flight not using a binary as such, but actually it's going to create this deterministic function compute that, that allows you to read in the text input and then write it as a WAV file. And it works. Um, I'm not sure I can, maybe I'll be able to demonstrate this. But anyway, so um, feel free to, to, to have fun with this, break it, um, play with it, right? Um, so since we've got some time, which is perfect, um, we can actually, I can actually show you some, some of this stuff. Um, now, I got rid of most of the, the, the things so that we can actually do it live here. Can you actually see this, or is it too small? Is it OK? Or should I make it bigger? OK. Bigger? Is it better? Yeah, cool. Right, so um, uh, Yes, yeah, so this is a bit tricky, and there was some discussion about this on the WASI Discord uh, lately. Um, WASI still implicitly assumes that you're going to define your main, so that the main entry point to WASI is underscore start. That is true, and because WASI is mainly based about on, on, on the concept of lib pre-open and file system, and you know that you actually pre-open the directory and then you insert some stuff into it. Um, if you do it my way, this stuff is, is not going to work. Because um, essentially using libc here doesn't make any sense. You basically call the syscalls directly. So it's kind of like lower level. Um, and all we do here, we actually export compute, and that's it. So that's why in Rust you need the no mangle, because we, we can't afford mangling, right? We actually need to be able to read it uh, without mangling the name, uh, pub extern C. And then we have um, in as the input was the file descriptor, and out as the output was the file descriptor. Um, and right, and what Martin, what Martin was saying, um, so I modified wasm time just a little bit so that I'm actually blacklisting um, random get and all the syscalls that can cause non-determinism. So they're not there. 
And if, if, you try, if, you, if you do it at home or after this and you want, just check it. Try to invoke it and it should panic. Basically, it should trap because the, the import is not there. Um, and the next thing is, there's also a manual for this. How, well, we, you're going to see how we're going to run it. Basically, you specify, added like two flags to wasm time that allow you to open, um, basically assign a resource to a descriptor directly. So you don't, because currently the way it works is that you can pre-open directories, but what I did, I tweaked it a little bit, that, that you can pre-open files and actually reduce the writes to either read or write, and that's it, okay? So that this, this, this actually works. Right, so, um, so the, as I said, the hello was meant to basically open in, read from it, uppercase, and then write to out. Um, so very quickly, uh, we're gonna create some temporary buffer here. Um, Let's say a thousand. Obviously, you would do it in a different, more like safer way, but we don't care about this here. Now, um, the thing you need to actually read from FD read is an array of I of extracts in 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 Wasi. So um, this is I of X, and then it requires a pointer to the buffer. In which case, ooh, that's going to be buff, and then we're going to take pointer out of, sorry, out of this, and then also the length. Okay, so now basically, um, we basically pack the buffer into a WASD struct that we can then pass into FD read and read in the contents into it. So then what we do, um, we call, and this is unsafe for obvious reasons, um, we call the FD read syscall, which basically takes the input file descriptor, in this case, rn. Uh, actually, if you call it without, it's gonna trip immediately because we don't have the FD write on the input file descriptor, which is exactly what we want. We, would, we just want like a one-way stream, right? And there we create the array of i of x. In this case, it's only one, and that's it. So this is gonna read uh, the contents of whatever we point at with input wasi file descriptor into the buffer. Then what we do, um, let us actually do the uppercase. Um, so this is from UTF-8. Oh, and I should probably have that. Yeah, you should probably do like the proper error handling here, but I'm not gonna even bother with this. Um, so from UTF-8, uh, and that is gonna be the slice we just read into. Uh, oops, the buff, and then however much we read, and then unwrap, and then we can do two uppercase. Okay, so that should be two uppercase. Then, unfortunately, we need to create uh, a CI of extract, which is used for actually writing out in WASI. It's, it's pretty much exactly the same as the IOVEC, in the sen except for the fact that the pointer is, is const, it's not mutable. Um, oh, and it's not, this is actually too strong. And we just call the syscall, which is um, CI work. And that's it. Um, so that's the first example with basically reason, uppercases it, and writes out. Any questions on this? Yeah. No, but again, if, if we were doing like a library out of this, then yeah, that, that actually would even make sense to, to create something like Lipsy. That would be the, above the, the raw syscalls. Like, I don't know, stream in, stream out thing, but you know, I didn't have time to actually do this, so yeah, that would be a great idea to actually have a from or try from or whatever, right? So, having this, let's try and compile this. Um, oh, I highly recommend a Cargo Wazi tool that was written by Alex Brighton, it's great. Um, it actually saves you a lot of hassle with passing in targets and stuff. You can even do testing. So, uh, I'm gonna actually use um, Nightly because I know that Nightly is up to date with the current snapshot for Wazi and Rust. I'm not sure whether it's stable caught up yet or not, uh, but you can have a look. So this is gonna build it. Oh, it's gonna be all, yeah, okay. Actually, let's go into Hello Compute. Uh, 
Right. So it built it in target. We have the hello compute wasm, right? So now about the invocation. Um, so I'm going to do this with tracing on, so you can actually have a look what this, the, uh, execute, the what the call sequences for the syscalls as well. So this should be this is useful for tracking what's going on. Sometimes it's not enough. Sometimes you have to add some debugging because there's there's too much stuff going on. But for this for starters, this is pretty good. Um, so the, the flags I added are pre-open read, which is going to take some input file in, which I haven't created yet, so this should actually shout at me. Um, and this is going to use that as, as the stream in. And then pre-open uh, pre write, which is basically going to save it to a file out. And that's it. And I'm going to use the experimental um, argument invoke for wasm time, which basically allows you to, um, instead of running start of the wasi module, it allows you to basically run any export. Okay, and that's it. There is, there's absolutely nothing there. Oh, and because our function requires um, uh, input file descriptors, we're going to pass them as the last arguments. So, okay, that's pretty good. So we indeed haven't passed in the um, anything. Okay, so we have we have this, and when we run it. Um, there is a lot of stuff happening here. The first bits are not really that important um, for us now. It's basically telling you that it's inserting certain pre-opens into the WASI context, which is basically this table that we're talking about. Uh, one of them is uh, FD11, and FD12 should be somewhere here, but I can see it. Maybe it's FD10. Um, anyway, so there we have FD read, and it read 20, 20 bytes. Should be about right. And then it should write out the same amount, okay? Even though the buffer was 1,000. So we can test that, and yeah, there you go. So this works. Um, if we tried, so we can, this is kind of cool because you can, we, you can play with it now. And if you tried to call uh, something crazy, right, like actually random get, uh, it's mutable, right, yeah. And uh, yep, wrap. Okay, cool. Um, so this should not work. Now let's have a look. Right. Yeah. So I guess this is what Martin was was, was suggesting here. That basically, the input random get is not found in the module. So you can actually do that now, it's, but it's not, it's not clean, right? It, you, you'd have to maintain your own runtime, and I'd like to avoid this. I'd like everything to be like according to the spec. That'd be amazing. Right, um, so the next thing I wanted to show very briefly is actually, um, I'm not gonna write that out myself. So that's the test that you can find, the, 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 the test example that you can find actually in the repo. Um, essentially, it doesn't do anything complicated. It basically calls fd, fd start get on the file descriptor, and then it, it, we can actually compare the, the write space. So we're expecting the editing to be zero. Uh, for the input file descriptor, we want the wasi writes um, to be read only. So this is wasi writes fd read, and for out to be writes fd write. So if we run this, um, It's fine, right? Everything was success. You can see it here and here, and then it output is zero. So that means no errors. So the, the writes are there, and they're properly constrained. Um, so for the, for the most complicated example, um, there is a, a slightly bit more code here. So this is actually taking the C library and um, adds Rust wrappers on top of it, and actually you can do the flight. Um, I'm, I'm wonder, I wonder if I can show you that actually works. Um, so I'm not going to bother actually going through this code because there is quite a lot of, it's, it's very, very um, flight specific. Just trying to you know, hook in the C library in Rust and basically just invoke it. That's it, there's absolutely no magic there. It still follows the same architecture that you read in. You do some processing and then you write out. Um, so I wonder if I can show you guys. Uh, da, 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 da. 
right? So now out should be a WAV file, and it is. Right? I'm actually going to move that to. Should be easier. Uh, right? Do I have? Right. Forgive me for this. I oh, will see if it works. So it actually works, right? So you can actually do, oops, sorry. You can actually do some more complicated stuff with this as well. Obviously, this is just an experimental thing, so it, it's meant to break. Um, but I guess it's a good start, and we can build from there. So going back to this. Right, so um, any questions? Because I think we've got like five minutes left or something. Thank you.